And this is Ken Kreitzer for Cam Vets Media. We cover cadets, midshipmen, the military, and veterans. And today is Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And to discuss this holiday and uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, uh, some Navy thoughts, uh, we are so glad to have with us Fleet Master Chief Retired Raymond Kemp, who is a provider of Kemp Leadership. Uh, solutions and a 33-year veteran of the United States Navy. At the end of his career, he was the senior enlisted sailor in the entire U.S. Navy. Ray, how are you today? Uh, I'm motivated, Ken, prepared to serve. It's glad to, I'm glad to be here with you today. You're always high energy and, and glad to uh, to talk with you and call on you today. Uh, tell us your thought on today, uh, the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an extraordinary American. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you look at, read some of his speeches now and you see how much uh, he was ahead of his time and how much leadership he provided and uh, and uh, see the challenges that he faced. Uh, what What's your thoughts today? Yeah, I, I, it is a uh, it's interesting to me, you know, as we consider uh, Dr. King, his probably his most um repeated speech, and dare I say the most re, re, uh, uh, acceptable speech, is the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, and he spoke very frankly about the, the challenges that um, were happening here uh, in the United States for Blacks at the time. And he, um, but I, you know, I don't know if, if I would say that he was uh, per se ahead of his time, because those those challenges that they were facing then, regrettably, some of them we're still facing now uh, when it comes to uh, equity in the workplace, when it comes down to uh, voting rights, when it comes down to uh, treating people you know, with dignity or respect, whether it be publicly or privately. I think some of those challenges that we are uh, that he was facing uh, in the 50s and 60s, we we still face today, regrettably. And I believe that he 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 was ahead of his time when it comes down to the aggression with which he spoke, uh, but because of his eloquence, the sharpness of that blade didn't necessarily necessarily cut uh, in the same way Be because of the the way that he was a uh, proponent of nonviolence. The the sharpness of what he was actually saying didn't necessarily sting uh, as much as it would have been if it would have been said in a more forceful forceful way. So there was so much that we learned uh, from Dr. King uh, that I'm really, really happy that we have the opportunity to, to take the time uh, and, and recognize some of the things that he said, some of the things that he stood for uh, globally, uh, and some of the advances that we, we were able to make. And I think, you know, piece by piece, brick by brick, step by step, uh, we'll get to a place where it, there is a fair and equal treatment for everyone uh, in America, as as his dream stated that um, his children uh, would be able to integrate with others based on the and be respected based on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. We're on our way there, but we have a, a ways to go. If I may just speak very frankly to you, my friend. Absolutely. Now, uh, you touched on it. What would be some of the things that Dr. King would be speaking about today? Uh, if we had the opportunity here is his uh, his perspective uh on i think on the strength of the amount of speeches and and sermons that i've listened to from him and i and i grew up uh, in the bible belt uh i am the the grandson of ministers on all sides of my family so many speeches i have heard and i would say that he would he would be speaking very frankly uh, about the um about the war effort uh because he was you know uh, very pressed about peace uh, during the Viet at the beginnings uh, of the Korean conflict. I, I'd say that he would be uh, definitely uh, speaking about uh, women in the workplace. You know, uh, fair um, fair wages for fair work. I mean, the the same work that he would uh, be uh, putting forth words uh, and encouraging uh, employers to pay women the uh, the same that they do for men because that's still uh, not being done very regrettably. Uh, and I know for sure uh, that he would certainly be weighing in, or I'm sure to say, I'm very confident that he would be weighing in on the challenges that we're having at the border uh, and how we should be looking to uh, be uh, altruistic when it comes down to treating people uh, fairly and allowing 
uh, folks to, to come across the border. And then lastly, if I may, he would definitely uh, have uh, more commentary, just as he did in those days, uh, about voting rights uh, and the gerrymandering that is happening in some states where there are uh, efforts to subdue uh, the Black vote. So uh, I, I'm sure that those, uh, I'm very confident that those are some of the things that he'd be talking to us about today. And I think that, I think it's all of our responsibility uh, who take the time to listen and appreciate Dr. King to at least consider, you know, where do we as individuals stand and then how can we have an impact on that in our nation? Maybe just ask you about uh, the military at this point. Uh, uh, my father was a big advocate when he was in the army in the, in the 1940s and fifties uh, for the Truman executive order that, that uh, integrated the, the military. And uh, you've been, had extraordinary success uh, in displaying leadership and rising to a senior position in the U.S. Navy during your career. Where, where is the military, would you say, on advancement and opportunities for minority groups uh, across the board? Sure. I, you know, I'd say that, again, we are we are making strides. Uh, however, we have uh, we have not you know, arrived. I, I, I believe that there will always, of course, always when it comes down to fairness and equality, I think that is uh, that is a journey that we we will likely always be on. I'm not sure if there is any place in our society where we can say, okay, it's even. Everybody is treated the same way. The the playing field uh, has the same challenges for everyone. I don't know if we have that and. I would say that one of the places where it is most closely aligned is in the military, uh, and at the senior and at the junior ranks in particular is very much a meritocracy. Uh, however, in the more senior ranks, um, if you just look at the complexion uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, if we look at the complexion of the uh, various different administrations, uh, top officials, you can see there's still a bit of some in inequities there. Uh, when I retired in 2019. Uh, there were, I was the first, uh, the first black uh, fleet master chief for Navy Europe, Navy Africa, and I got selected in 2016. Uh, and that's, that shows, you know, that it's still not equal. The Navy is still the only uh, military service that has not had a senior listed that's been a black person. And so I believe that the, we have a, a ways to go. Um, and hopefully, hopefully those that are still wearing the uniform uh, in the Department of Defense are considering that at the higher ranks. Uh, how, the number of uh, senior you know, generals, uh, the senior officers, the number of senior enlisted. Uh, it is, you know, we say that there is a meritocracy. However, at the most senior ranks, Ken, is something that may not be known outside of the uh, uniform, uh, is that those selections are made by folks, by people. Uh, there's either a board that's there, uh, or there's a person making that final selection, as is the case for the Master Chief of the Navy. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, the phrase, as the saying goes, duck, ducks pick ducks. Uh, and so until there has uh, been uh, something that we can really scrutinize when it comes down to the selection process, we still have a ways to go. Uh, again, I will admit we are far and away uh, ahead of corporate America, but we've got a ways to go. But I'm proud of where we are right now. Yeah, so we're so uh, appreciative and uh, admire the career that you had of service in the United States Navy, 33 years and rising to become the Command Master Chief on USS Harry Truman, the aircraft carrier. And then, uh, and then your uh, position in uh, in Europe uh, with uh, with uh, the uh, Navy there. Now, I want to just touch on a couple of things that you're working on, and one is that you are on the board of the American Battle Monument Commission's representative, and you travel representing this organization that takes care of the American cemeteries overseas and many historic places. Uh, tell us a little bit about what what you're doing with the American Battle Monument Commission. Yeah, it's, it's been a great uh, honor uh, to have been uh, selected and appointed, actually appointed by the president to the American Battle Monuments Commission. Uh, we are still uh, working together as a, as a strong team of uh, 11 commissioners going out and speaking on behalf of the president at various different monuments and cemeteries uh, around the world. Uh, I, mean, I think I mentioned last year I had the opportunity to go to Italy and I spoke in uh, Rome and up in Florence and came home, dropped my bag, picked up another bag and flew out and spoke at the uh, commemoration of the Battle of Mid Midway out in uh, Hawaii. Uh, this year, I'll have the opportunity to do some more travel. But what I would like to take the time and say is that 
this year is the 100 year uh, anniversary of the American Battle Monuments Commission. So um, it is uh, something that we're really proud of. There's some great celebrations that'll be coming, uh, coming up very soon. And uh, I look forward to uh, celebrating uh, with the nation, uh, the uh, service members who gave the ultimate sacrifice uh, on foreign soil. Yeah, we actually took a trip to uh, the American Battle Monument Commission cemeteries in Italy, in uh, in Florence, and and in Nettuno. Uh, as my father had served in World War II in Italy, and they are amazing. Uh, they are so well kept and so proud places uh, that we encourage people to visit them when they are traveling in Europe. I I, I visited the American Cemetery in Cambridge, England, uh, where many of the flyers uh, who fought in World War II are commemorated. Yeah. Uh, so that that's a, a very extraordinary project that I'm glad to see that you are able to serve on. One other, a couple of other questions. You mentioned uh, that you have a, a friend who you met in your military service with the Ukraine Navy, right. and that you've been going back and forth a little bit on how they're doing. Uh, uh, what's a sense of uh, how things are going from your uh, your colleague in, in Ukraine? Uh, I tell you the 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 fighting is real. Fighting is tough. The he's the uh, he's a sailor there, uh, and has had uh, his fair share of combat ashore. Uh, very much like when we were initially in the long war over in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had sailors going in, in uh, ashore with particular skill sets and specialties, uh, able to to help in that effort. He too is sending sailors ashore uh, and uh, doing their nation's bidding. The most encouraging thing to me is uh, the, the statement by their, their president when he said, you know, we, we and other nations were offering uh, him transportation to get out of the country when that war first began. He's like, I don't need transportation. I need uh, bullets. Um, and so the attitude that he had, I think, is just a great case for leadership. And when I talked to my buddy and we exchanged, he sent me a, a Thanksgiving note just saying happy Thanksgiving. They don't even obviously celebrate Thanksgiving there. Uh, and I said to him that he was in my thoughts and I was uh, sending, you know, good positive vibrations and so forth. And he said, things are, things are tough, but victory will be ours. And so the mindset of their country follows their president, which is very exciting to me. I'm, I'm very encouraged uh, and thoughtful uh, about those folks who are in the fight as a combat veteran myself. Uh, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that soon we can come to some measure uh, of peace over there because war is tough. Absolutely. Now, one other question. Uh, we were chatting about uh, Army-Navy football, which we spent a lot of time covering, meeting the players at the two uh, academies. And you mentioned that uh, something we've seen is that uh, uh, playing football, which is a very intense, passionate, discipline activity, uh, lends itself to uh, military, uh, small group uh, coordination and leadership and activity. Tell us a little bit about what you see in the benefits of uh, what they learn playing football that will help them when they join the army or the Navy. Absolutely. My, my hope is that when those uh, young, you know, gridiron tested uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines uh, make their way into the fleet and into their specialty, they bring that mindset of teamwork, that, that mindset of sacrifice. I heard it say not too long ago that um, if you, if, if you don't sacrifice for the things that you want, the things that you want become the sacrifice. And so when they transition from the uh, the gridiron onto on the Navy, a steel deck ship, uh, that same mentality of we're stronger together must come with them. That same mentality of there may, the, there may be an occasion where you have to give 80% and I give 20 and then uh, you give, I mean, I give 80 and then you give 20, that, that measure of... Uh, of uh, the sacrifice for one another, extremely uh, important. And what they learn uh, on the field and in their small group leadership training is applicable to real life. Uh, there are people who have various different roles on the football field, whether it be an offensive lineman uh, and the quarterback, or whether it be the defensive backfield uh, and the kicker. Everyone has a role. And when they realize and accept it on the football field, they'll be able to transition that to uh, the Army who will to be able to transition that to the Navy and to the Marine Corps. Uh, and they become strong leaders when they are uh, willing to learn the effort of the unit that they become a part of uh, and then lock arms, fight and win. Absolutely. And uh, fleet 
Master Chief Ray Kemp. Uh, final thought for us today on the day we remember Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., an extraordinary American. Yes, sir. My final thought would be that that we ought, we take a look at the things that he stood for uh, ar around the world, how it wasn't just uh, a, a black effort. It was for women. It was for uh, children. It was for those who may not have been able to stand for themselves. Consider his stance and then take a look at ourselves, not to measure and compare ourselves, but take a look at where we stand and then make a decision if we can do better and then do better. Very good. Fleet Master Chief Ray Kemp, uh, so good to talk with you. 33-year veteran of the United States Navy, at one point the highest uh, ranked enlisted sailor in the entire U.S. Navy and uh, uh, Command Master Chief in Europe and aboard the USS Harry Truman. Uh, great to see you today, and thank you for your service to our country. Uh, pleasure to be here, Ken. Thank you. Good to see you. We'll do it again soon. And it's Ken Kratzer for Cam. That's Media. Thank you for watching.